I feel humbled, honored, honored to be in your presence, honored to be entrusted with your pulpit, just honored to be here. You are such an awesome people. You're the people of God. And I'm trusting. Can you stretch out your hands towards me, please? When I get behind the pulpit, I've always tried to get my uh, butterflies to fly in order, in information. But I really trust and pray that by the grace of the Spirit of God this morning, you'll be well fed. So I've worked hard for this and prepped for this. I've labored over this word for a long time. I've prayed, and all I'm asking you to do is open up your hearts like fertile soil to receive the Word of God this morning. Let's honor both the Word and the Spirit. Amen? I'm trusting for a supernatural impartation that you're going to leave this place this morning with increased revelation of the gospel of the kingdom of God. I want to say to you this morning that you are valuable in God's eyes. More valuable than you could ever believe or comprehend. But every single one of you sitting in this place this morning, you are unique. You're one of a kind, created in His image and His likeness. If we truly understood the ultimate intention of, of, of God our Father, I think to a large degree we'd live life very, very differently. You see, for God so loved His Son Jesus that He predetermined according to His sovereign will that His Son Jesus Christ would have a multitude of brothers and sisters who would rise to the full stature of Jesus Christ Himself. His sovereign will is also that this family of Jesus, this family of God, would be a temple filled with the Holy Ghost, that the, temp that the Spirit would have a temple for eternity, that Jesus would have brothers and sisters for eternity, and that the Father would have this incredible family for eternity. And we know that things got mucked up in the garden. But God is restoring, amen. I was overwhelmed this morning. I was in tears this morning. Because when I watched in the pre-service prayer meeting, the people kneeling on the floor, and I saw your grandson raising his hands, I felt the love of God. I was overwhelmed by the love of God. This beautiful prophetic picture of this eternal kingdom family. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. I spent a couple of hours at the In Him conference talking about the gospel of the kingdom of God. I spoke about the rule and reign of God. I spoke about the significance of Palm Sunday, the 6th of April, 32 AD, when God revealed to the world through the person and works of Jesus Christ, His rule and reign, what it looks like. And what I want to just, by introduction this morning, I want to say this. 2,000 years ago, they may have rejected Him. Some sang, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the religious Pharisees, who were actually a picture of the, of, the, of the fig tree without leaves, the religious Pharisees actually said, tell your disciples to shut up. And Jesus said, these very stones will cry out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When Jesus Christ was rejected, on the 6th of April, 32 AD. And he cursed that fig tree because it had no fruit. Full of leaves, which is a picture of religion. It's a picture of people who, and leaders who will want to restrict you to function and form and make sure you dot the I's and cross the T's and you obey all the laws. I want to just encourage you. To do everything you can with the grace of God to discover the reality of the kingdom of God in your life, in, in your church community, 
and so that you can take this gospel of the kingdom to the world. Amen. You see, their hearts were closed 2,000 years ago. A whole bunch of them. I want to encourage you to go listen to the, the two hours of teaching on the kingdom of God. But hearts were closed and hearts were open. And I want to say to you this morning that the heart that is open to the reign of Christ enters into the reality of His presence. The heart that is open to the reign of Christ enters into the reality of His presence. And I was so overwhelmed this morning because the heart of this church family is open to the reign of Christ. And as long as your hearts are open to the reign of Christ, you will experience the reality of His presence. Amen. I shared uh, at the In Him conference that Christ obviously goes to the cross, surrenders to the will of His Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then the Son of God hangs on a cross. And for what I see from the Scriptures, Jesus bled from at least seven places on His body and each of them are of immense significance. Now I submit this to the theologians that are in the room or the Bible teachers that are in the room, but my understanding of when Jesus' side was pierced, they didn't break His bones according to prophecy, but they pierced His side. And out gushed blood and water. When a woman gives birth, there's the shedding of water and blood. It was out of Christ that a kingdom people were born. And so I want to talk to you this morning about a kingdom people. And I want to say to you this morning that you are the family of God. There's no family in the universe like you. And so I want you to turn, please, in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to lay a foundation in the time I've got from the Word of God. And then I'm going to tell you a very, very, very cool story. It's a cool story about a shaky people, a powerhouse club, some cool shoes, some nice breakfast, some steam trains, liberated girls, happy slaves, and more. But I have to, for you to enjoy the story, I need to give you the backstory to this story. In 1 Peter chapter 2, this was the passage that drove me to my knees, I got saved and discovered Jesus Christ. Well, he, discovered, he didn't discover me, he found me, I discovered him and I read this passage of scripture as a Roman Catholic all those years ago. Undid me this passage. I'm not there, I'm in the wrong book. We're getting there. 1 Peter chapter 2. Where am I? Here we go. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this in verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone. Can you say living stone? stone. Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I want to drop down to verse 7. Now to you who believe, the stone is, this stone is precious. That's speaking about Jesus. But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. A stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is the message of the gospel of the kingdom, which is also what they were destined for. But you... You, 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 you are a chosen people. A chosen people. You're chosen. I hope that just dispels right now a spirit of rejection in this place. You're a chosen people. 
a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Let me pause here for a moment. The stone the builders rejected, it's mentioned in Psalm 118 and 2,000 years ago on the 6th of April, 32 AD, when they sang Hosanna in the highest, part of that psalm, well, that was the previous slide. Don't worry about it. Leave this one up. But the, the psalm actually speaks of the stone the builders rejected. Now, now, the scriptures don't give clarity on what that rejected stone. When did the builders reject the stone? But if you go to extra biblical historical literature, you will actually, dis and you search long enough, you'll discover that in, in Jewish tradition, uh, uh, when they were building the temple, the stone masons, because the Word of God says that it was not meant to be the sound of chopping or cutting on Temple Mount. In, the stone masons were cutting the stones for the building of the temple, and they were sending these stones up onto Temple Mount so that the builders could take the stones and actually put them in their correct place. And one stone, Jewish tradition ha has it, arrived... And it was a peculiar shape. And the builders looked at the stone and said, they, 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 they must have got it wrong. They said, take and get rid of it. It's a defective stone. They rejected the cornerstone. Because it wasn't shaped like any other stone. And they took it out to the Kidron Valley and they got rid of the stone. And when it came to laying the cornerstone, they were going, where's the cornerstone? And the stonemason said, well, we sent it up. It was the stone that the builders rejected. It became the cornerstone. But here's a key verse. Let's drop down to verse 12. It's a key verse here. This royal priesthood, that's you, live such good lives among the pagans. <laughs> Don't you love it? The pagans. It's pretty PC. Live such good lives among the pagans. That, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. Please say good deeds. And glorify God on the day that He visits us. Please go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'll put it to you this morning, for those who are taking notes, that chapter 5 to 8, chapters 5 to 8 are not, not a list of rules, they're expressions of kingdom life. In verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You, my brothers and sisters, are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds. Can you say good deeds? Good deeds. And praise your Father in heaven. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to give you in Matthew chapter 6 the answer to the global economic crisis. I'm going to give you the key on how to break poverty in your lives. I'm going to give you this church the key from Scripture for abundant provision. Amen? Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Like some of you in this place, I, uh, I, I do a little app. I invest in some cryptocurrency, and I've, I've done well, actually, to be honest with you. I'm not a, 
You'll see my Lambie outside. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no ways. <laughs> it was a joke. Okay. It's like a few hundred dollars here or there. You know, I noticed that uh, one of the things I do every day is I go into my app to see how it's doing. It's like this. And they hurt my back every now and then trying to find my coins on the floor. Where your treasure is, there you'll find your heart. If your heart is not in this church, well, why don't you put your, your money in the church? Your heart will follow very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on. Say amen. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Oh, boy. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted, devoted. And Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread and to the fellowship. This is the same word, devoted. They will stick to, they will cling to, they will contribute to, they'll invest in. Or he'll be devoted to the one, either devoted to money and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. So Jesus was dealing with the issue here of the biggest problem on the planet. It's the fear of lack. The fear of not having enough. People fear two things. Death and not having enough money. And so Jesus knows that. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is full of light, how great is the light. And he wants you today to become a light-eyed Christian, not a dark-eyed Christian. It was a Jewish idiomatic expression that the Jews used in the day. The Scots would say he's got deep pockets and short arms. The English say he's a Scrooge or he's tight-fisted. In New Zealand, or I don't know if it's ours, they say tight as. We won't put what the as in. What the as comes after as. Okay? I wasn't talking about that as. It's my accent. Tight as. A-S. So Jesus is saying, you know something? Let's just recap on this. Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. But put them in heaven. So into heavenly things, to kingdom things. And don't be a Scrooge. Don't be tight-fisted. Because a tight-fisted man or woman are revealing who their master is. <laughs> yeah. Don't be tight-fisted. Don't be, and if you are, you're full of darkness because mammon has actually gripped your heart. But a man who's full of light, who has a light eye, is a man who's filled with generosity. He knows who his provider is. He knows about seed for sowing and bread for eating. He knows how the kingdom principles actually work. He knows how the kingdom of God works. It's not hoarding, it's giving. It's not staying, it's going. It's the complete opposite of the kingdoms of the world. And so Jesus is dealing with a very key issue here, and it's for us today, because then he goes on to say, don't worry about tomorrow. Now, it's not easy. One of the altar calls yesterday, I think it was, had one of the best responses, and was the one around the issue of money. If you're insecure as a preacher, just say, who wants more money? And then take a photo. And say, look at the altar call. Instagram is so false, eh? There's eh? You never put your bad pictures up there. We moved into a, a, uh, a cinema temporarily while our building was being sorted out. It was the worst service I've ever been in. 
because the mall forgot to open the doors. Because we were in the cinema at like 9 a.m., but the mall only opened at 10. And so the, mall, the cinemas didn't tell the security that this church were coming in. And so the band had uh, sh shopping trolleys with drums in them and guitars. And we were all waiting, and the security guard stood behind the glass. He's and our administrator is trying to get a hold of the manager of the, of the movie, saying, you've got to get these people in. And people, the cars are arriving, and there's a crowd behind us. It was a disaster. We, when they opened those doors, eventually we ran in up the escalators into the cinema. They put the pulpit in the front. There was this big wall and all like this, and uh, the projector didn't work. The musicians, it was too dark in the pit in the front. They couldn't see the... It was a disaster. I couldn't see my preaching notes. It was terrible. It was shocking. I was embarrassed. It was awful. And somebody took a picture. It was glorious because they, they captured one or two or three or four people in the front row with their arms raised, and the lights up the stairs in the cinema were sending these beams down. It looked glorious. It looked absolutely glorious. And people are going, whoo, the glory of God. What a joke. Terrible. What you should do when you do the before and after pictures, just leave the before on. Be real. <laughs> Let's move on. Get back to the word. Oh, help me, Jesus. Verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or drink and about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than, than food? And he, and he goes on and he talks about anxiety and fear and not having enough. Then he gets to the key issue. Verse 33, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be, given to you, will be given to you as well. The guaranteed antidote to a lack of provision in the church is a church that will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, in seeking the kingdom of God, Listen to the two, the, 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 the two sermons from yesterday. I think it's yesterday. But one of the things about this verse that actually puzzled me was how do I seek for righteousness when I am already righteous because of the cross and because of my faith in Jesus Christ? How do you pursue something that you already are? And as I shared, I think it was yesterday, that I actually stand righteous in Christ, but I live righteous through Christ. I stand righteous in Christ. Righteousness is imputed to me. It's given to me. When God looks at me, He sees the righteousness, the perfect standard of Jesus. And it doesn't stop there. Because I live a righteous life and He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And we're going to see this morning that a people who pursue righteousness and the kingdom of God will have abundance on the path of righteousness. You think, oh, this is works. Hold on a second. Are we getting there? Turn with me to the book of Job, chapter 29, please. Job 29. The oldest book in the Bible. You go to Psalms and then keep going left. Job 29. You're not going to get into the background of Job because I need to press on. Now we all know the story of Job. And 29 is just an incredible chapter, but I want you to drop down to verse 11. Whoever, whoever heard me this is Job speaking about himself. Whoever heard me sp spoke well of me, and those who saw me commended me. Whoever saw Job spoke well of him. They commended him. Verse 12, because I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist him, the man who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. 
I put on righteousness as my clothing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the cause of the stranger or the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. There's justice and righteousness. Yet righteousness is a cloak and justice is a turban. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 19 and then I'm going to tell you some cool stories and it'll all make sense to you. Revelation chapter 19. All ties into kingdom family and who you are. In Revelation chapter 19, from chapter 19 to 22, deals with the second advent of Jesus, the return of Christ. In verse 1, after this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven saying, or shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are His judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne. Then a voice came from the throne. Then a voice came from the throne. I said yesterday that the, the foundation of the throne of Jesus Christ in heaven is the foundation of righteousness in, and, and justice. And so from this foundation of righteousness and justice, the King of all kings, the ascended Jesus Christ, the exalted Messiah, the Son of God, who takes away the sin of the world, this shepherd king, this God king, says the following, from the throne, praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, Woo! Like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding, the wedding, the wedding in this wedding venue, the wedding, the wedding of the bride has come. And His bride has made herself ready. You've made yourself ready for the wedding of all weddings. For the wedding of all weddings. I said to the people at the conference that fivefold ministry are not superstars. They bridal attendants to get her ready for the groom. You don't get fivefold ministry walking down the aisle, look at me, look at me. When the bride walks down the aisle, can you imagine? You get, you get uh, some of the, people, the ladies that go in front actually upstage the bride. What, were you, what are you going to think? Hey? Eh? Or like that, uh, yeah, the one who wears white and shouldn't be wearing white and you get all that stuff. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You get at least one who wants to upstage the bride. Fivefold ministry are there to actually equip her for him. Not as they look at me, look at me, look at me. The bride has got herself ready. Now listen to this. You remember I said that righteousness, I stand, when Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, he has the antidote to lack, to lack in the church. I'm talking about financial lack and provision for everything that I've called you to do. You see, Jesus will give you what he orders you to do. He'll give you everything you need if you are on the path that he has called you to walk. Are you with me? 
And so when he says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first my kingdom, which is my rule and reign. Just surrender to my lordship. And seek my righteousness. I stand righteous in Christ. I'm already clothed in righteousness. It's imputed to me. But it's also imparted to me so that I can walk a path of righteousness. Jesus never, ever, ever taught that you can be righteous and live like a pagan. Because out of your righteousness, you'll live a righteous life. You'll be righteous in your marriage. You'll be a, and it's not just individual righteousness. It's corporate righteousness. Because you're called to be a righteous community. <laughs> Let's see what that looks, what righteousness is. You ready? I hope this blows your socks off, what I'm going to say. His bride has made herself ready. Can you say the bride has made herself ready? So fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Christ. Perfect. I stand perfect. God looks at me. Love is, love is blind to a degree. Looks at me. Sees the righteousness of Christ. All my bent corruption that was, was in my body. And I, I, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. He lives in me. Okay. Jesus is the last Adam. The first Adam was unrighteous. He was bent. He was bent in, through sin. He was corrupt. The scriptures say Jesus was the last Adam. The perfection. God in flesh. Righteous in every sense. The last Adam. Can you say last Adam? Last. Not second Adam. Last Adam. The last Adam takes the sin of the world on him on the cross. He takes all your bentness, all your sin, past, present, and future. He goes, he gets, he dies. He says, well, he says, Father, it's finished. He dies. He gets put in the grave. He comes out in his resurrection body, glorified. The last Adam was left in the grave. You're not Adam. You're a new creature, a new creation. Okay, let's move on. Now, verse 8, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts or the righteous deeds of the saints. Fine linen stands for the righteous deeds of the saints. So fine linen... Bright and clean was given her to wear. And then in brackets, this is the Holy Spirit, inspiration of the Spirit. It says, but fine linen also stands. It stands for the righteous acts, the righteous deeds of the saints. And so Job says, I put on righteousness like a garment and I wore justice as a turban. What did he do? He defended the cause of the fatherless. He helped the weak. He fed the poor. He, he bound up the brokenhearted. He set captives free. And when those injust, when injustice came the way of the people, he would break the fangs of those who wanted to bite them with injustice. He defended the cause of the weak. He looked after those on the margins of life. He looked after the weak and the vulnerable. So when it says, let your good deeds shine and people praise God in heaven, when you seek first kingdom and righteousness, you're seeking for righteous deeds in Sydney. You're looking for the lostness, the pain, and the brokenness in Sydney and society. Your eyes are open like a Nehemiah to see what's going on in your community. You're not just about a holy huddle once a week with the glories. You know, you've got something very special here. And I'm burdened when I say this. What you have will not last if it does not translate into the lostness, the pain, and the brokenness of your community. They are lost because they are outside Christ. There is pain because there is societal pain. Even in this auditorium, there are single parent families. There, 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 there are people who are struggling. You just walk around your city. And take the time just to keep quiet. Don't say anything. Don't even pray. Just look at your community and ask God to show you what He sees. And you do that as a community. That's the function of an apostle is to actually look at the lostness, the pain, and the brokenness is the systemic brokenness. 
The systemic brokenness. It's broken. You come to my hood in South Auckland. You see brokenness. You'll see things in South Auckland you're not going to find in Remuera and Ponsonby, the upmarket areas. In their areas, you won't find pokey machines and gambling joints and third or fourth tier banking loan sharks. You won't find as many McDonald's in their areas you find in my area. You won't find good food in my area, but you'll find good food in their area. You'll find that it's actually more expensive to buy fruit and veggies than it is to actually purchase a loaf of white bread filled with sugar. There is systemic brokenness and injustice in society. It is there, the lostness, the pain, and the brokenness. And we can get into our gatherings and we can experience the glory of God and that is so, it's, it's, it's a non-negotiable. But Martin Luther said a gospel that does not translate into, and, and, and is outworked into every facet of society is no gospel at all. And so the bride gets herself ready. How does she get herself ready for the groom? Through her righteous deeds. Through righteous deeds. It's for men and women to stand like Nehemiah and just look at the city, to weep over the city, see the city through the heart of God. You see, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd and the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, he said, he actually said in John chapter 10, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. They're all in Sydney. He loves them. He bled for them. He died for them and they're part of his bride. Amen? Amen. And he wants you to see them and to reach out to them and be righteous, do righteous deeds. Now, and he loves Sydney. He loved Nineveh. You don't engage your Nineveh, you're going to end up sushi. Like Jonah. You're going to be the sushi. He loved Babylon. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you to declare the Lord, the plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Woo, woo, woo. It's for me, it's for me, it's for me. It's in the context of Babylon. And you are in Babylon. It's called Sydney. And he said to the, Isra said to the Israelites, I actually took you into Babylon. Go look a little further on from verse 11 in chapter 29. He says, I took you into Babylon. I took you. Our God took you there. For what purpose? You know what he actually says? Go and read it for yourselves. So that you would seek its welfare. Because in its welfare lies your welfare. In its welfare lies your welfare. And you know what he says? Pray for Babylon. Pray for it. Bring it before me in prayer. Pray for your city. Give your sons and daughters in marriage. Build houses, plant crops. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Your prosperity is on the path of righteousness, of righteous deeds. King Solomon, ask of me anything that you want. You're going to be the king. You can ask of me anything. Now, my heart fails me because I love super yachts. I do. I've got this thing about jets, airplanes, and, and boats. I'm going to take up an offering for my jet after this. <laughs> I'm choking. My church would shoot me. Doesn't mean you can't have a jet. Solomon could have asked for anything, for wealth, power. He could have asked for a woman. He could have asked for anything he wanted. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You know what Solomon says? Give me wisdom that I may administrate with justice and fairness and righteousness your kingdom, that I may distinguish right from wrong. God gives him the whole caboodle because you've asked us one thing. This is for you. Leo, press into the Lord. It's for your team. 
to ask him for wisdom to administrate his kingdom. You know what actually happened? Solomon became the richest man in the world. And yeah, he did have all the wives and he did mess up and he did do stupid things. But it's on the path of righteousness, on de or doing deeds of righteousness and seeking to be righteous and just, to clothe yourselves in righteous deeds and be just in your community. You want to know something, my brothers and sisters? That the world has, whenever the world, where something's actually going on in the world and there's this issue of social justice and social justice. I'm not talking about the social justice of the world. I'm talking biblical justice. The social justice of the world wants to cancel you. It wants to kill you. It wants to put a, 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 a victim identity on you. It wants to throw you in prison and remove you. Biblical justice is taking care of widows and orphans, the poor, the brokenhearted. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you. For what purpose? To preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom to the poor. To set captives free. You get the point. We saw it in the life of Jesus Christ. Now here's an amazing thing. Is that uh, so Solomon ends up with it all. Solomon's a good illustration of Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Now let me tell you a cool story. Because you need a practical application. If we look over 2,000 years of church history. Is there a people group that have actually got this? Really got this? Well Jesus got it. Obviously, because he modeled it. Paul modeled it. But was there any other people group that actually modeled it? You know, let me tell you the story about shaky people, a powerhouse club, cool shoes, as I said, nice breakfast, stream, steam trains, liberated girls. I'll tell you a story. It's about the Quakers and the Clapham sect. In the 18th and the 19th centuries, let this wash over you because this is you. The Quakers were called the Religious Society of Friends. They were called the Religious Society of Friends, but because they would have their gatherings and their meetings and the power of God would descend upon them and they would get filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to shake and quake. They became known as the Quakers. Something like what was happening this morning under the power of God. Their influence on British society was absolutely profound. They represented 0.2% of the population of England. They were ostracized and persecuted because they were weird. They were people of the spirit. The British government passed the Five Mile Act in 1665, which meant that Quakers and other dissenters were unable to live within five miles of any town or city in England. They were persecuted, imprisoned, banished, publicly whipped, branded, executed, usually for defying orders of banishment. They were banished from educational institutions. They couldn't go to university and neither could they hold office in government. At the same time, there was a group of people called the Clapham sect. They were Holy Spirit people. They were God people. They were people who understood Micah 6, 8, do, right, do justice love mercy and walk humbly before the Lord they understood Revelation 19 that the bride of Christ needs to prepare for the return of Christ this Clapham sect was led by a man called William Wilberforce there were people who understood the lostness the pain and the brokenness of British society And some of the most prominent members very quickly was Wilberforce. He was a member of parliament. He was in government and he was an Anglican. He was a man called Henry Thornton. He was a banker. He was from the Church of England. He was Zachariah Macaulay. He was a governor in Sierra Leone. And he was a Scottish Presbyterian. There was Charles Grant, a director of the British East India Company. There was John Venn, who was an Anglican minister. And he was a philosopher and a pastor. There was James Stephen. He was a lawyer and a member of the Church of England. Thomas Babington was a barrister and politician of the Church of England. Hannah Moore, this woman, she was a writer and part of the Anglican Church. There was William Smith who was a geologist and he was also a member of Parliament and he was a member of the Church of England. There was Edward James Eliot who was a member of Parliament and also a member of the Church of England. In Matthew 13, the story is going to come to a close quickly. Jesus said that 25% of the seed that is sown 
which is the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God, falls in fertile soil. And the fertile soil, so 75% of the soil never gets the message of the gospel, even though they hear it. 25% of those who hear the gospel of the kingdom of God will receive it, said Jesus. They hear it, they receive it, they understand it. They produce a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. And then they actually become kingdom seed. When Jesus explained the parable of the wheat and the weeds, he said, they said, we get all of what you're saying, but tell us about the wheat and the weeds. We thought when you came into Jerusalem and you were the king of all kings, you're going to remove all the weeds. He said, no, there's going to be a, a period of church history where the weeds are going to be present. But he said, you know, this is the good seed. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the sons and daughters of the kingdom of God. You understand the message of the gospel of the kingdom. And then he says, I'm going to take you and plant you into the highways and byways of the world that you'll become good trees and bear good fruit. You won't be like a, a, a fruitless fig tree that needs to be cursed and removed. But you'll bear fruit 30, 60 and 100 fold. And so yeah, we got uh, William Wilberforce and we got the Clapham sect and we got the Quakers. You know what, actually, what Jesus said in Matthew 13? They said, why do you speak in parables? You know what he actually said? Because you get people who see but do not see, hear, do not understand. And you know what he says? Go and look at it in Matthew 13. And we're going to see this in the rest of the story very quickly. Jesus said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God are given to you, but not to them. And God wants to impart to you, GGC, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He wants to impart them to you because they are lawyers, they are doctors, they are street sweepers. They are people in this auditorium this morning that God will give you the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God so that you could break out in supernatural, righteous acts within your community. Here is a kingdom people. Listen to this, what God does with this people, this, this group, this Clapham sect and these persecuted Quakers. They made the, a contribution in the fields of science, literature, art, law and politics and far more. In the realm of industry, there was a man called Edward Pierce who opened the Stockton to Darlington Railway in Northern England. Bear in mind, there's a five mile rule. These people are persecuted. And in the midst of their persecution, this is what God does with them. There's a man called Lloyds. And people were losing their ships. And God gave him a revelation and said, why don't you put money together and get people to contribute to a fund and when your ships actually sink, we can at least, the guy doesn't get bankrupted, we can actually pay out money. And so Lloyd's of London was birthed and it still exists today. British men were getting drunk in pubs. They were working, getting work to, working themselves to death and then getting drunk in pubs and it led to fatherlessness and broken families. There was a man called John Cadbury. Another man called a round tree. Another one called Fry and Terry. They invented drinking chocolate. And opened up drinking chocolate houses to, to, to counter the pubs and the alcoholism where the gentlemen of British society could come together and feel safe and they could have drinking chocolate and conversations together and not get drunk and actually beat each other to pieces and neglect their families. The Quakers promoted equal rights. They fought for the abolition of slavery under the leadership of William Wilberforce. Quaker women such as Lucretia Mott and Susan B. Anthony Forgive me. You said dishonored woman. The church. Push for women's rights. And today, oh, where's the church? They focused on the right of women to vote and influence society. And we debate today, can a woman be an elder? Get behind me, Satan. Gosh. Gosh. We focus on ecclesiology when we've missed the gospel of the kingdom of God. In the outer court, in the court of the Gentiles, we talk about church structure and church government. 
Those are tables that God will, kick, will come in and kick over. The Me Too movement was birthed out of a legitimate grievancy that women are dehumanized and seen as objects. And the problem is because the church doesn't rise up where men don't rise up in the church and show what a liberated woman looks like together with their woman together. Not silent, pregnant and in the kitchen. But powerful woman who understands submission to the king and mutual submission in the body of Christ and what it actually looks like. I'm getting into trouble. Honestly. And many of these men and women, these Quakers, many of them, at risk of losing their lives, they assisted thousands of slaves to escape by putting themselves at great risk, helping many to flee to Canada. They set up shops to sell the goods that were produced from farm slaves. They pushed for prison reform. They took Isaiah 61 literally, that the purpose of the anointing in setting captives free, they pushed for prison reform. They pushed for the abolition of the death penalty and that you treat prisoners as human beings and treat, treat them justly. Elizabeth Fry and her brother, Joseph Gurney, they campaigned for more humane treatment of prisoners and the abolition of the death penalty. Thomas Young, an English Quaker, God gave him revelation in the area of optics. And he contributed to the wave light theory. My, uh, Maria Mitchell was an astronomer who discovered a comet in those days. John Lister, God gave him the secrets of the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. He actually went into the whole issue of sterile, this, the, person, the, the importance of being the sterility in, um, uh, in, in, in medics. Thomas Hodgkinson discovered and identified Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkinson's disease. John Dalton formulated the atomic theory of matter. Lloyds of London, as I said, still exists today. It was actually, Lloyds of London was birthed out of a chocolate drinking shop. Next time you eat your Cadbury slab of chocolate, be reminded of this message. <laughs> All the founding families of Barclays Bank were Quakers. It was just banking. It was just and righteous. And so Barclay formed a bank because no banks would deal with them. And today we have Barclays Bank because they could be trusted. They were pioneers in the iron and steel industry. The first railway line opened up in 1825 from Stock Stockton to Darlington. It was called the Quaker Line. George Stevenson invented the railway engine. George Bradshaw, another one. He published the first ra railway guide. It's called Brad Bradshaw's Railway Guide. And it was the first person to publish rail a railway timetable for the public. Jonathan Carr became Carr's Biscuits. Clark started a business manufacturing shoes. Quaker Oats was some good breakfast. Then there was w uh, Richard, uh, William and Richard Lever started Lever Brothers. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Wow. We've got this thing that if my ship comes in, I don't have to work. I'm just going to go and some pina coladas on the beach. There's two parts to your call. You call to life in the kingdom of God and you call to work in the kingdom of God life and work the twofold nature of your calling is to life and to work my brothers and sisters the thing you're good at the thing that you are good at the thing that actually floats your boat and blows back your hair is your vocation and if you begin to see what's happened to a group of people who understand what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness you'll see the work that you do in a very different light. Would you please stand?
That's what it means to be a kingdom people. Whew. Please forgive me for sounding so intense. Let's end on a, a lighter note. You didn't go in, into law to make money. You went into the law for reasons of justice. The business men and women that are here today, point of the spear today you're valuable in God's eyes he's wired you the way that he has and those that love the dolphins and the whales want to go out to save whales and dolphins got a passion to save the whales and the dolphins God wired you that way why because they're his whales and they're his dolphins because he said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole of creation. Mark 16. Teseology, the whole of creation. He wants you to take care of his cows. Be good produce, milk producing cows. He wants you to look after your chickens and your farms. And bring everything under the gospel of the kingdom. He wants your business to come under his kingdom rule. So you can be trustworthy and he can impart to you treasures. Of wisdom and knowledge like Solomon. So that you can transform your world together. He wants to form in this house a Clapham sect and in this city a Clapham sect where men and women, apostles and prophets and engineers and doctors and lawyers can come together and transform your, your world. And so in closing, and this is closing, he says to them, I want you to seek the welfare and the prosperity of Babylon, the very city that you are called to, that you despise. I want you to seek its welfare. And this didn't come from Boney M. This didn't come from Boney M. How many of you know Boney M? In Psalm 137, this was their response. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked for us songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy, and they said, sing, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while we are in a foreign land? Their response was to hang their musical instruments, their talents and their gift, giftings in the poplar trees. When the very Babylonians were crying out, sing for us the songs of Zion. Get rid of your charts about the rapture and pre and post and all that stuff. Put it aside and go and save your city. Go and redeem it. Go and rescue it. Go and look for the widow and the orphan. Go and sing the songs, the songs. Go and sing the songs of Zion over your city. By the rivers of Babylon where we sat down, the Babylonians are saying, sing over us. There's something about you, sing over us. Nah. By the rivers of Babylon where we sat down, oh, when we remembered Zion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for the the soberness that's in this auditorium this evening, this morning. I ask and pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, that you would raise up, raise up, raise up the Clapham sect in this house. Raise up, Lord God, a spiritual, powerful priesthood of all believers in this house. I pray that every single one of them, Lord God, would see their value. They would see, Lord God, their value. They would see their contribution. Fill them with the Spirit, Father God. Lord, I actually want to decree and declare assignments, assignments, heavenly assignments, kingdom assignments over this house. It would make 
a difference in this community. Bless them, strengthen them, strengthen them, Father God. And I pray that the gospel of the kingdom of God would take deep root in the heart of this church. I ask this, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ.